This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. In addition to Honey Badger's great error monitoring service, they also have an uptime monitoring for web developers. And Honey Badger has recently shipped an update that allows for public status pages that can help communicate outages to your customers. In addition to your uptime monitoring, Honey Badger now monitors your SSL certificates. And Honey Badger now has actions which will allow you to do bulk updates to all your errors, or you can set defaults for incoming errors. In this episode, we're going to look at setting up a development environment with Ubuntu. And in the past, I have created an episode on developing with Windows using WSL2. So in this episode, we're going to look at getting our Ruby on Rails environment set up on a fresh install of Ubuntu 22.04. And I do prefer the .04 releases which come out in April that are the long-term support. I find them to be more stable, even if all the packages are not up to date with the latest versions. And for the purpose of this episode, I am recording on a Mac OS, so I will need to download the ARM version of the image instead of the x86 AMD64 one. So just make sure, whatever your computer is, that you're downloading the appropriate image. And so the first thing that we'll do is go into the terminal. And inside the terminal, I'll run sudo apt update, I'll enter my password, and then I'll run sudo apt upgrade, and this is just to get all the latest packages. We'll then need to install a few packages with sudo apt install, I'll add a dash y, so we won't be prompted. And I am going to use RVM just because that is my preferred Ruby version manager. But we do have some prerequisites that we need to install first. We'll first install the new PG2. We'll also install curl and git. It'll go through and install these packages. And then we can start moving forward with doing the gpg2 dash dash receive dash keys. And I'll paste these in here because they are a bit long. We can then run the curl command to install RVM. And once that's done, we can run the source forward slash home forward slash, and I'm just going to do this with interplating in the who am I, just so in the documentation notes, you could just copy and paste this in. In my case, the who am I is going to return cobalt. We then do the dot RVM forward slash scripts forward slash RVM. We can then do an RVM list known and this will list out all of the known Ruby versions that we can install. But before I do that, I do want to update some of my dot files. So I can do an echo with a gem colon dash dash node document, and this will get injected into our home directory forward slash gemrc. And this will allow us to install gems without installing the documentation. The documentation not only takes up space, but it also takes time to install the gems. And since there are some flags that I like to use on every new Rails application, I'm going to echo those as well. So I like to do a dash dash JavaScript and then the ES build. And we'll send this to our home folder and then the dot Rails RC. We could do something similar. Instead of the JavaScript ES build, maybe we want to do the CSS bootstrap or tailwind or something else. And then we can install our Ruby version. So we'll do a RVM install 3.1.2, which is the latest version as of this recording. And one thing I like about RVM is that it's going to install some of the additional packages that are required for RVM and the Ruby to work properly. I remember installing system rubies back in the day, and this was always one of the biggest hiccups, which kind of led me to use RVM in the first place. It was just so much more simple to use, and I've been using it for the past many years without any issues. It is going to take a little while to compile the Ruby version, on my particular case, because there was no binary rubies available, so it is having to install it from source. But if you are on an AMD or Intel processor, then this step could go a lot faster. And once that's done, one thing I like to do is to always run the gem update dash dash system just to make sure I have the latest version of the Ruby gems. We can then run the gem install Rails to get Rails installed. And that shouldn't take too long, but before I create a new Rails application, 
One thing that we'll need to do is to install Node and Yarn simply because I do have my .railsrc file by default using ES build. So I'm going to copy and paste this command that will download the node setup script. We can then run sudo and then sh node source setup. And before you run any script from the internet, it's always a good idea to look at it before you blindly execute it. But in this case, we're just going to go ahead and run it, which is just adding some sources to our app sources. And then it's running the apt update. So from here, we can then run the sudo apt install node js y and it's going to install node for us and then we need to install yarn which we could do a similar thing where we add to the app sources the location for the yarn packages or because now we have node installed we can do the npm dash g for global install and yarn we do get a permission error which means that we will have to run this as sudo and once we do that we now have yarn installed and so now I'm going to go into my documents folder and we can then create a new Rails application. Because I have the Rails RC dot file, it is going to install ES build and bootstrap automatically for this new application. But after a few moments, it should be done. We then go into our example application and we can run the bin dev to start up our Rails application. We see that it starts up successfully. We can then visit our local host, port 3000, and we have our Rails application up and running. And my preferred editor is Visual Studio Code. So if we go to code.visualstudio.com, we can download the Debian package. Or if you are on a different chipset, this is going to download the x86 version. We can come over to the other versions, and then we can download the 64-bit, or in my case, the ARM64. And again, that's simply because I am on an M1 machine using parallels to virtualize Ubuntu for the purpose of this episode. So typically, if you are on an Intel or AMD machine, you will just do the normal download. This will download. I'm going to quit my Rails application. I'll go to my home folder, to the downloads folder. We can list out our packages. We then see our package there. We can then run sudo depackage dash i for install, and then we can type in the Visual Studio Code library. We then go to our show applications. We can type code to find it. And I'm going to pin it over to my side. We can then launch it and it runs. If we close it out, I'm going to go back to my home folder, to the documents, to my example application. I can then just type code dot for this current directory and it'll launch Visual Studio Code in this directory. And so when I'm setting up a new environment, one of the things that I try to do is to keep things as simple as possible. I don't have many dot .file configurations, and I don't do too much customizing with my operating system. I try to keep things as vanilla as possible simply for the fact that if I ever need to reinstall my system, or if I get a new computer, I don't want to spend all day or several days getting everything set up exactly the way I like it. If you're in a situation where you do like having a lot of customizations, then I would recommend having some kind of dot .file they will load in a lot of your personalizations. One thing I really like about Visual Studio Code is that I can turn on the setting sync, which will allow me to synchronize to a GitHub private gist, all of the different settings, keyboard shortcuts, snippets, extensions, and the UI state. So that way, if I just sign in with a GitHub account, then it's going to automatically download all of the extensions and the settings that I've had on my previous computer. And so if I'm working on a fresh Rails 7 application, then this would probably be the normal steps that I would take. However, as an application ages, or if I'm having to work on older applications that are using older Ruby versions, then it could be a pain to get my environment tweaked to be proficiently productive on that particular application. In that case, I really like using Docker. And with Docker, that's going to allow me to have a consistent development environment or experience for that particular application. And overall, it is my preferred way. And if you are using Ubuntu, one really nice thing about using Docker is that the overhead on performance is going to be very minimal because we're not going to have to run a virtual machine in the background like you have to do on Windows or on Mac OS because the underlying kernel that we're going to be using on the Docker containers is the Linux kernel 
And because our main operating system is using that, we won't have the performance overhead of that virtualization layer. So we can run a sudo apt install, and we are going to install this by adding a source to our app sources so that we get the latest version. But before we do that, we need to install the apt transport HTTPS. We need to make sure that we have the CA certificates and the software properties dash common. And we'll install those. And then I'm going to paste in the next two lines, which is just getting from the docker.com the latest Ubuntu GPG keys, just so we know we are downloading from the official packages. We'll then echo into our app sources a new file, Docker list, which just has the source list for the Docker packages. We then run the apt update with the sudo command. We'll see that we are now pulling from the docker.com for those packages. We then run the sudo apt install docker ce, and then we'll continue. This will download Docker and get it all set up for us. But one issue here is if we try to run the Docker run hello dash world, we'll get an error that the permission is denied. So we would have to run the sudo docker run hello dash world in order to get this up and running. And we really don't want to do that. So we can run the sudo user mod dash ag. So we are modifying our user and we are adding them to a group. The group is Docker, and then we'll insert in our user. Oh, and that does need to be the squiggly brackets instead of the parentheses. Now we can log out and create a new terminal, or we can run the su dash and then the user again. And now we can run the Docker run hello dash world, and it works. And all of these commands will be in the show notes on driftandruby.com. And finally, I'll say that Ubuntu is one of my favorite Linux distributions. It's one that I've been using for over 10 years. And on the desktop side and the server side, it's been my go-to solution. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.